Hangout. By joining Hangouts, you can ask questions, work together through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today, I've had a little bit of a regression in my uh, live stream setup. I'll just point out, I was experimenting last stream with um, OBS configuration to add interactive uh, stream elements such as the live stream chat and a donation button along the bottom. Um, I just upgraded OBS, uh, just a very small patch level upgrade and uh, the browser plugin is gone, so <laughs> I'll have to figure that out. Um, and then just figure out in general what to do with the uh, space around the code and browser preview. I would like to incorporate the chat so that this is more interactive. Maybe I'll just have the chat overlay fly out and disappear. That could be as simple as that. Um, the donation page didn't seem to take uh, get too much traction. I'll consider bringing it back though. It was a quick experiment. Today we are working on the Western Friend website project. This is built with Django. Web Framework, which is a program with the Python language, and a content management system called Wagtail CMS. And Wagtail essentially is a WordPress-like content management system built on the Django web stack. There's a whole bunch of layers there. Um, but it's really, I think, a mature foundation. Django's been around for about 14 years. Um, and Wagtail just adds a really nice um, usability on top of the, the Django um, developer exper experience. Um, Wagtail also brings a very nice uh, developer experience and community uh, together. So I think it's a really great package. I highly recommend it if you're considering um, developing a content-oriented website project. It'll get you up and running really quick. Um, we had a slight regression in our project. In a way, uh, essentially what happened is we've upgraded to Django 3. Uh, I'm sorry, well, let's see. It's Wagtail 2.8. Somehow <laughs> our dependencies um, have caused an error. Uh, I think it's one of our packages is not supporting Django 3. So let me bring up this issue here that I opened a moment ago. And I'll have to reproduce this on our master branch. But when I upgraded Wagtail, I think it was this 2.8 upgrade or 2.7. Um, Wagtail now supports Django 3, which was released a few, few months ago. The dates here. Or it was very recently, but uh, 3.05 is out now, so it's been out for a while. Um, and essentially, what it boils down to is uh, one of the packages that I've relied on um, doesn't really support Django, and we're using it to define a custom user model. So, this auth tools package is throwing some errors in a branch I was just working on. Um, I'll make sure that this new branch. Uh, which is forked off of the master has the same error. And then we'll see if we can maybe just remove that package. The auth tools package. Let me just double check the stream to make sure that I'm not missing any chats. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so this is a known issue with auth tools. There is a feature request, uh, but it's really unfortunate we can't have these showstopper <laughs> bugs. Uh, and we're trying to launch this fast, and it supports Django 1.11 and above, is what it says in the README. Um, and all we do need to do here is to define a custom user model that uses um, the email field instead of a username. We don't need the username field in our project. So that's why I turned to the auth tools package. Perhaps it was too much. It was a little bit of overkill. So anyway, one other thing I have to make sure um, works 
is that the Wagtail authentication form will still uh, function correctly. I think we should be good to go. If I just switch out the abstract base user, I don't know. <laughs> so we'll see how much troubleshooting is involved here. Uh, but essentially, Django comes with the built-in authentication backend. Uh, one of the first things you should do in a project is um, define a custom user model because you'll typically have to, um, you'll want to change it down the road and it's harder to change the more, uh, the older your project gets and the more users you have registered. It's, it's difficult to change the user model later. This is just a development project so it shouldn't be, there's no hassle for me to change it now and just deprecate this abstract email user. I did find a, a nice tutorial, testdriven.io, and it's been updated recently. It's written for Django 3, although I'll acknowledge that, uh, well, the Django APIs are pretty stable. Uh, admittedly, there's this, um, essentially, the Python 2 support is being dropped uh, across the Python ecosystem, which has been a long time in the works since about 2008, I think, when Python 2 was released. Um, but now it's really time. Uh, 2020, uh, I think Python 2 end of life is like this month. So let me just double check that. Oh, yeah, it's already passed. And so, essentially, just a lot of, well, it's still not without controversy, but it's been quite a while. Uh, and frankly, I'm in the camp that just says, yeah, you know, the Python language needed to go through some revisions over a decade ago, and yeah, they were substantial, but we've had a decade to adapt. And, uh, so let's let's adapt. So it is causing a little bit of pain here because these um, packages have supported, you know, including Django has supported Python 2 Unicode backwards compatibility. And now that that's been removed with Python 3 or at least refactored, um, it's causing a little bit of um, breakage in this auth tools package. So I thought rather than wait again for the auth tools package to update, I'll just see if I can bake my own. Um, custom user model and see if, it, if this wagtail login works. So that's where we're at. Uh, we're going to probably use this abstract base user because we don't need any fields starting from scratch, more or less. The existing fields on the user model include, let's import these and take a quick look. From, so I'm going to hash this out. Mm. I haven't scaffolded this project. So actually this is going to be a little bit tricky to, to read the docs, but from uh, was it contrib? Now if we save that and F12 but abstract, no definition for abstract user. much more involved than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> but here's our uh, auth models. And now I should be able to in inspect that default model. So it comes with a username. Um, you know, a lot of sites you want to have a username and we're still in discernment on the Western Friend side if a username is going to be beneficial The two things we're concerned with at this point is that we have a functioning authentication model and that I think we want to go through an email validation step. 
time to think of it. So I've got to make sure that at the end of this pull request, we've got both of those. And the email validation will just show a message in my local console. It's going to be at a little bit of uh, difficulty. I'll just have to double check that. Uh, but here's the deal. I don't think we want this first name and last name fields. Is so if we import, you know, you get all of this, the email field, username field. But whereas with abstract user, um, you essentially don't have anything, so you have to... <laughs> define all that yourself, which you can see here. So we have to put username is none. Not sure why that would be required. Hey, what's up Tatsuo Yidlin? A lot of people like to log in with email, but mostly sites say log in with username or email in the same field. Yeah, that's a good idea, too. Um, and I think that's where these um, custom user managers come into play. Because you can... Um, I believe you can hook into the authentication system. Not exactly sure, but uh, like auth user or something like that. I, but, but, but let me see if we can take a quick look at that. And in other words, you could allow people hmm, to authenticate with either username or password in the same field. But basically, mm, yeah, we're just not going to have a username. I don't know. What, what's your preference in, in general? What do you usually, what's simpler for you to remember on websites? I sort of lean towards having, you know, everybody has to have an email so that we can reset their password and things if needed. And the only reason we were thinking in this site um, that we might use an email, I mean a username, excuse me, is if we have like a sort of a discussion forum feature, but we don't have that planned yet. <laughs> we're, we're sort of like in the long-term roadmap, but you know, we might just use an off-the-shelf open source discussion platform, which we've been considering. If I can integrate discourse, for example, user authentication with Django, then we would use you know, discourse, which is an excellent uh, user form. Other than that, we don't have any real need for uh, usernames. So can I just say your name is Tatsu, Tatsuo? Is that your first name? And I usually log in with email. Yeah, so that's kind of what we'll, we're going for here as well. And just how do I pronounce your name just so I don't uh, <laughs> keep butchering it in the chat? Yeah, that's fine to call me. Tatsuo. Okay, great, thanks. So let's even just explore the Django docs a little bit. This is all new territory for me. Uh, everything, you know, every day we're learning new stuff anyway, so that's the life of a developer. Okay, so, yeah. Manager is basically the layer between Django and the database is like the ORM, but uh, that's also what a model is. That's why it's a little bit confusing. Their database query operations are provided to Django models. So the model is like the actual interface right there against the database is the closest part. And I guess these managers allow you to kind of um, add extra methods to them the ORM custom queries you can see here as an example and the default query set which is just if you ask for objects all and 
Now it seems I should almost be able to do this without the username field because our login and register form already have the correct fields. Man, I'm trying to remember this now. <laughs> it's been so long since I've worked on this part of the project, and I'm using kind of off-the-shelf stuff, so I didn't define any custom templates here for accounts. I think we're just relying on the wagtail. Um, excuse me, the wagtail default um, authentication form, uh, registration form. So let's just start with the, the abstract user model. I'm going to ignore the username field and see if it works. So we don't need that. And we'll just need that. All right. What kind of projects do you work on, Tatsuo? Do you do software development? And this is, interestingly, I guess, a breaking change, perhaps, in uh, Django 3. I, I saw some errors in the previous um, bug report on the Auth Tools website, where a user had, one of the contributors had tried to go through and make it compatible with Django 3. There's not, I think, a lot of breaking changes. Django's been really good about backwards compatibility. There's a pull request. And, uh, yeah, just not really certain if or when it will be fixed. Uh, now it's just git text. So even this uh, tutorial might be out of date, or maybe you don't have to lazily load those strings in. Just took web development back in college, getting into it. Lots changed. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you can get by though. I don't know how when college years were, but, uh, you know, PHP is still around and uh, really strong. Ruby on Rails, Django has been around for 14 years. You don't have to ride the fads. You know, HTML and JavaScript written in the 90s still runs in the browser. So if you stay close with, um, you know, technologies that are built to last a little bit, you won't have to thrash around so much. And by that, I mean just you don't need to go too deep into the JavaScript um, ecosystem. Uh, just a little bit of JavaScript is good for most projects. It's all you need for most projects to be successful. So all your web development skills, I mean, I think are still going to be valid. Especially, you know, you've been using a lot of React. Okay, well, yeah, I think that's even overkill for most projects, to be honest. Uh, specifically um, avoided it for many reasons in particular um, I don't like that the, so many aspects of web development are being kind of reinvented in JavaScript I think there's reasons that um, CSS and HTML evolved as separate languages and it's because they serve separate functions the ones a declarative and sem semantic uh, templating language, language essentially, a U, uh, document structuring language, but also templating. And the other one is um, sort of a constraint-based layout language, CSS. Uh, and then JavaScript is the imperative, increasingly declarative um, data and interactive layer. I think they adding all those in um, to the same bucket and the same eye span and same context, mixing it all together is. Um, an anti-pattern we learned it coming out of just PHP web development uh, over a decade ago. I think this is a major backwards step for web development. I like the idea and I support the idea of going in a declarative direction, but also I think HTML is already declarative, so um, I hope that we come out of the you know tunnel with renewed um, 
sort of standardized approaches to declarative componentization, like web components, um, but with uh, you know data binding and things like that. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's my two cents. Yeah, it's separation of concerns, and it's not um, separation of languages. It's not just doing that because for the sake of doing it. It's because there are different mindsets, there are different frames of thinking. And in some ways, there are also different disciplines. Um, not everybody's a JavaScript programmer. Not everybody likes to look at HTML or XML or CSS even, so yeah. but at least we were able to kind of coexist. And I don't know how, how, and just the churn of reinvention is huge waste. Uh, you know, the web platform has a lot of really great things built in, like accessibility and stuff that people worked on for a long time. So, yeah, I just think it's pretty misguided as an industry, as a discipline. So that's why I'm sticking on this uh, project and most of the stuff I do with just basic stuff that's been around for a while. Tattoo says, yeah, I know things were supposed to be separated. Yeah, Node, you can write back in with JavaScript. Yeah, that's pretty interesting too. And for a while I was also fascinated with Node and actually I've got, written a production app with a Node-based um, framework. It's not, I don't know, if I has they call it a framework called Meteor.js? And I've looked at several node-based uh, frameworks of various degree of frameworkiness. Every project you work on eventually has its own sort of conventions and um, utility classes and things. So you, we always inherit a framework of some kind, right? Um, and just these, uh, so Meteor.js, there's like Feathers, uh, there's Sales.js, uh, you know, there's backbone, things like that, um, but they really pale in terms of back backend and server side rendering. Uh, they pale in comparison with what you get from a Laravel in the PHP ecosystem, or Ruby on Rails, or Django in the Python ecosystem. I think there's Spring in the Java ecosystem. I don't think JavaScript community comes together cohesively enough to build uh, out. To build up, rather it's kind of like a sprawl in a churning landscape of sort of uh, abandon. Meteors had a lot, a lot of promise. Um, it's very interesting, um, particularly the real-time data aspect is pretty exciting. Um, it's been acquired, and in the project we built, I actually built two production apps with Meteor. Um, we actually didn't rely as much on the real-time data. So, you know, honestly, that these uh, what we built uh, should have been done with Django <laughs> in hindsight. Uh, but Meteor was like the right fit at the time of, for my development path. And it did, the promise it had when I started working with it is it made the path real easy for somebody to get um, a project off the ground. and even scale it. But then the idea of scale took over and the ethos of does it reach Facebook scale and how do you do React with it, I think really just sort of destroyed me Meteor, um, the original ethos at least of being developer friendly and simple and um, you know most projects don't even need to scale that substantially and by the time you do need to scale um, you might not scale the same way that Facebook scaled. Like each of these projects and companies and have their own constraints and uniqueness. But you know, Meteor is still being developed. It's been acquired, uh, but they're they're just the the um, project has shifted. It's lost its mission. Uh, the community is sort of elsewhere. Where's the release? And it just never came to fruition that it, it misses key aspects that you just need in a, in a framework. And firstly, they're using, um, it was coming out at the time where NoSQL was a very um, you know, popular, it was a fad. 
And so they, they embrace the MongoDB, and that's the only really officially supported database for Meteor. And when I started projects with it, I'm like, okay, whatever, that sounds cool. Oh, NoSQL's popular, there's a lot of uh, mind share there. But it turns out both the projects I've worked on, production apps, uh, they, we essentially have a relational data model. We have a bunch of entities and they're related in various ways. Either people are relating to houses or um, we have this other project where people own APIs, they're managers of APIs. Anyway, there's tons of, there, it's just a relational model. Uh, and so you, to do that in Mongo, you end up reinventing all of that in JavaScript. And you can't rely on, you know, some things that are already baked into Postgres or MySQL. So Meteor never became sort of, in my opinion, a framework. It, it left out really crucial things like a router. They just wouldn't adopt an official, there's a re recommendation, but it's a community maintained package. And a framework needs to incorporate key components eventually. Uh, you can't just leave it to the community. I think that's a mistake uh, because the the initiative dies and it happened with Meteor. They had this original templating language called Blaze, which is handlebars based, really makes it easy. Um, now that things are going towards React and Blaze got removed. Um, it did come with account baking, which is a really tricky problem for most apps. So that was that was really cool. Uh, they invented their own sort of packaging ecosystem at first. You know, it comes with batteries included. The cool thing about Meteor, you know, aside from this full stack reactivity, uh, is really the developer experience. It, you know, it's built on Node.js and MongoDB, um, but you can start Meteor without in knowledge of any of that. You don't, you just run one command, like literally Meteor, and uh, your software is running, which is crazy. It abstracts the build tool from you. You don't have to know about Webpack, any of it. It's nuts. Uh, I still, I think, I haven't found anything like that from any other project. And that was the ethos that I think, that was the biggest loss. And I'm sort of in this frame of reference from um, um, Brett Victor and who invented small talk. Alan Kay and Dan Ingalls. This um, sort of um, human-centric idea of computers as an extension of our, our natural characteristics. Uh, natural human abilities, but giving us more precise ways of cr being creative and more powerful tools of thinking. And, uh, you know, Meteor, when I was starting to work with it, it was like one of those type of tools where you could actually, without very much knowledge, start making an app that people could use in real time and interact. And it was amazing for that. Uh, and it lost that path. And I haven't found a similar project like that. Um, people are too worried about scalability and uh, things like that. But yeah, Alan Kay has done a lot of thinking and research and uh, design work on making object-oriented interfaces where pe every aspect of the computing environment is something you can just dig into and change. They made the squeak language. And Brett Victor has this really cool talk, Tools for Thinking, Media for Thinking the Unthinkable, which I think we're really far from uh, these types of capabilities, not only at the interface level, but just we're, we're stuck down in this like imperative land. Uh, let me just see a couple of Victor videos. There's this other one. He gives a brief history of computing. He talks about the prospects of um, constraint-based programming and declarative uh, 
programming, he, he kind of puts himself back in the 1950s or 60s. There's some pretty crazy stuff on here. Brother Victor is a pretty out there, and so is Alan Kay. The future of programming, yeah, of course. And really, I think the idea is that everybody should be able to program, and not in the way like everybody should learn to program, but that every computer computing device should be made um, intuitive and ad adaptable to individual, like natural human tendencies and characteristics. The way we think, we think in like objects and physical, you know, touch and interaction, direct ma manipulation, stuff like that. And we're really far from that as a discipline. And I think honestly, React and th the like are taking us further. They're making it a more and more narrow enclave of people who can actually create, who can be creative, and they're putting a higher and higher barrier to entry on people to, from being able to realize their ideas and collaborate and share. Yeah, Meteor had a lot of promise, and it's still around. All right, so this is a really long digression, but it's something that it just bothers me a little bit. So here we are, back in Django land. <laughs> so we'll need an abstract user. We'll need to define. <laughs> cool. Who, uh, Tatsu, Tatsu, who, who inspires you? Like, do you have some uh, kind of interesting role models or, or books or videos that have kind of informed your uh, interest in getting back into programming? So I think if we just do the email, we should be good to go here. Now, we're not doing localization. For this project, we are they're pretty much um, all the users are in the Western United States for this project. So if we need to add localization, I'll come back around to that. So that's it. In these two meta fields, we should be able to log in with Wagtail, I hope, create a super user and things like that. All right, so let's go ahead and clear this out. <coughs> The field named has the username field for custom user model must not be included in required fields. That's strange because the hmm. uh, they're emptying it out there. Well, the email field is required. Is that maybe this will fix it? All right, cool. All right, so what I need to do is reset the database. Another cool thing. So Django, I think, does pretty good at like sort of straddling the. Um, well, it's not. I mean, there's a lot of learning if you want to build apps with Django, but uh, generally Python and Django, I think they at least uh, aspire to be you know, human-friendly languages, human-friendly framework, having batteries included, mature, um, stuff to last. So I think, uh, you know, little things like um, Django just starts you off with SQLite, just so you don't have to think about a database right off the bat, uh, so that you can just start developing your idea faster. I think that's, you know, a nice touch. Tattoo says, I was very much into design first in college, then I started web development, and I fell in love with programming back in jQuery. It was a big thing. Yeah, jQuery is still relevant. <laughs> Honestly, I'm using it. Um, I'm using it on this project. I 
think so. Let me double check. I'm, I'm almost positive of it. Yeah, it's still jQuery is still probably one of the best ways of, you know, having unified ways of like selecting, um, if, you know, searching in the DOM, selecting stuff, and applying operations to multiple uh, DOM elements with you know one command. It's called like um, what do they call it in, in uh, NumPy, uh, uh, vectorized programming, kind of where you you do one command and it applies on a vector or a list of um, items. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the things that hurts me the most is like the idea. Like, this comes from the JavaScript ecosystem community. It's just like, well, if it's been, if it's an old thing, if it has legacy, then it's it's crufty and old and shouldn't be around anymore. Legacy is a bad word, and I don't I think that's the case. Um, I know uh, React's been around for a while now, so it's getting into the, the realm of. What does it came out? Uh, 2014, I think. <laughs> so six years. It better watch itself. It's got some gray hairs showing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's really all I've needed. I've been very cautious about approaching JavaScript, and it's just if I'm doing basic things like changing the state of a button or making an AJAX call, I'm going to start with a really low-hanging fruit. PHP, yeah, and PHP is going strong. Yeah. Look at Laravel. The, this is probably actually right up your alley because you're coming from a design background. It's the PHP web framework for web artisans. I actually haven't worked with it personally, uh, but I think it takes uh, takes a lot of lessons from Ruby on Rails and maybe Django, and um, Sort of has this batteries included approach, or at least an ecosystem around it, and a company uh, who are viable. They're doing a, a good business. Uh, if we look here, you know, there's a lot of educational resources. I don't even know what else is going on, but Laravel has some crazy stuff um, that I wish would come to Django. Let me just check one thing. So it's got a lot of contributors. It looks like we've got, oh yeah, look at that, steady development, like mm, a handful of um, core contributors, so it's not just like one person show, and it's people who have been with it for a long time and hit, you know, coming in, in and out doing a few things, so yeah, th this is a good pulse, this is a good project, and the, the PHP language is growing. And Laravel has this crazy thing. Yeah, I tried it a little bit back in for the React app. That's what I'm working on with Django right now. Okay, cool. So you're yeah, you're going to Django way. Yeah, that's good to know. So that's why you're on my channel. All right, cool. But this thing, uh, let me see if I can find this. I think there's a Django equivalent, but basically, um, so a lot of times people, we kind of want this single page application like user experience where you know things are dynamic little segments of your template will be re rendered like a little functional execute it'll pull some data from the server and just update the dom or you know add a, a list of I items in there or remove an item on interactions things like that you know that um, typically if you want that kind of experience you're either going to write i guess relatively painful and verbose jquery code Blade, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Is that the one for uh, Laravel? Yeah. This is so cool. You can just, uh, it sort of uses the same templating syntax that you're already familiar with, and it just dynamically wires up the Ajax for you. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Okay, that's close, though. It's close. Blade is the templating language. Yeah, Ginger, okay, or, but wait, this is actually even cooler than that. I was, my, my mind was blown when I first saw this. I wish I could remember the name. Dynamic template. <laughs> Sorry, one thing, this is really cool though. I just, 
just don't keep up with Laravel. Airlock, so it comes with authentication. That's cool. Well, what it, basically what it does is you write your templates just like normally with Twig or whatever the templating language is. And when a user does something in the client and there's a piece of the page that should just re update, like a, they submit a chat message or something or, or um, do a bookmark or some kind of ajax -y thing where you don't want to refresh the whole page and you want the service single page app thing, this you actually define in PHP or in Django's case Python uh, a function that was um, invoked on the server uh, and by annotating your template your, uh, with a particular type of, uh, I don't know if it's a class name or exactly, I'll find the reference here. Um, the framework Laravel will wire the template and the back end together. And when it gets a certain, uh, you know, like an event inside of that template, like a click event or something like that, uh, or uh, form updates or something like that, it will invoke the server side function and the server side function will return rendered pre-rendered HTML fragment, and it'll dynamically update in the DOM. So it's kind of like doing what do, um, what uh, React is sort of doing, but it doesn't mean it doesn't make you like <laughs> commit your whole front end to the JavaScript. You can it's crazy, and I wish I could remember the name of this. If I can remember the name in Laravel, I can actually find the um, the equivalent in Django. And you know what? Livewire. Livewire. Yes. Did that flash on the screen or something? I don't know where that came from. Check this out. So you can basically have your cake and eat it too. You can stay in the language of your comfort, language and framework of your choice, and not have to commit your whole you know, to having two separate teams, JavaScript uh, front end, SPA, web packers, and uh, back end dev. You can do a full stack development, uh, single page app uh, experience. And by that, I mean just, you know, uh, things a little bit more dynamic, a little bit Ajax y, web 2.0, I don't know, <laughs> to use some old um, legacy terms or whatever. But, you know, that's what we're all about. We just want something to happen right when we interact with the device. That's the idea of drug manipulation that when you touch, uh, you know, like you pick up a lid of a teapot or whatever, you get some sort of feedback right away. That's the key thing. And that I think with this whole SPA framework thing has been a really long journey, a really long way, uh, sort of tail chasing uh, in ways probably more harmful than good uh, to get just essentially something that we're all, you know, we're so accustomed to just to direct manipulation, immediate feedback. But now these frameworks are catching up that have been around for a while, and they're actually giving you that the best of both worlds, where you still have, you know, server-side rendering. You never lost that. In fact, it was always server-side rendering. But and Ajax has always has been around for a long time too. You know, um, but just less boilerplate involved. So yeah, this is I think the the way forward, and you know, web components and things like that also. So yeah, then there's a Django equivalent. That's it's sort of a beta thing. Yeah, and if you start doing some Laravel stuff, let me know because I'm uh, curious. I don't think I'll, <laughs> you know, actually we're creating this project, the Western Firm website. Uh, we're porting it over from Drupal, which is a PHP-based content management framework, uh, mainly because I don't, I know we're going to need to do a little bit more customization. I don't want to work too much in PHP. That's just not my, my cup of tea. Um, more of a Python guy.
there's a I think I asked this or I reactor yeah this is actually a really good one to mention also um, it's a JavaScript um, library but the idea is that you kind of just still want to use Ajax is because it's Ajax underneath uh, you don't want to commit yourself to a whole front-end framework type thing or library like react um, but you know that certain elements are going to be more dynamic and you, you can target those and so intercool lets you take one step in that direction it automatically handles um, wiring up some Ajaxy stuff to endpoints and updating your DOM dynamically. It uses jQuery underneath as well. Uh, I've been looking at this one. I haven't quite um, kind of made it made the jump or made it fit into any project I'm working on. I think I can't remember the specific limitation I was having, but it was that uh, I needed I wanted to embed some state in the DOM. I wanted to treat the DOM as a first class. Uh, vessel of state and uh, JavaScript frameworks don't tend to want to do that. And this can even update other DOM elements when you interact with the button uh, under the examples. Uh, but it was a great recommendation nonetheless. And um, looks like there's a couple of projects that are trying to take this live wire approach. So we might be seeing it, and that's 10 hours ago. So this has been updated recently too. I'll just post all these links because. Uh, um, this might be useful for you as well. Yes, seven days ago. So these are relatively uh, recent activity. Yeah, and this is a good caveat. I mean, it's not a replacement for Viewer React. Some projects need that level, certainly. And I'm not even going to go into you know what my preference would be or anything like that. Um, I think the main thing is just keep it simple and evolve when you need it. And when you need a front-end framework, you'll know. But you don't need to start with one, typically. Have I used Redux? No. Like I said, to be honest, I haven't used React. I don't want. I don't really don't want to, honestly. <laughs> I just don't like this style of code. I've read React code. And I've, uh, I've contemplated and I've thought about using it. And I do web development and full-stack web development for you know, living and now I'm working more in data and stuff, but I do not want, I do not like the kind of code, yeah, that React sort of makes developers write. So, again, I don't want to start a flame war or anything like that. So. But I do want to mention the power of progressive enhancement because um, I think that is a, it's a really important thing to do. And um, by way of example, the Wikimedia Foundation have recently settled on a um, front-end framework to replace some of their JavaScript, custom JavaScript widgets. Um, and the, they needed progressive enhancement because no, firstly, not every user has JavaScript enabled. And secondly, well, I guess that's the main thing. They're going to have, um, and not every page is a full SPA. You know, they just have small elements. So things like this intercool cooler let you just drop in, do a little bit of progressive enhancement, add in the nice ajax -y stuff where it's needed. Most pages don't need it, though. Um, for the whole page, and you just need a little fragment of Ajaxy interactivity, like a bookmark or a button or something like that. So these take you quite a long ways, uh, unless you're doing something full interactive uh, page. But even, I mean, you could do Facebook style app without React or without that level of framework. I don't know. I would p put a bet on that. You could do it just a Django, mostly Django templating and a little bit of Ajax type intercooler JS library. I don't use React, uh, Facebook enough to know the implications of that statement. <laughs> yeah, so you, re Redux is very boilerplate. And I've heard uh, you've seen clone sites for Facebook and PageView. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, there's a couple good ones. Uh, oh, man. I was researching this a little bit. There's this really good one. Uh, there's Elg, which is written in PHP. 
because I was kind of want, itching to start a little community site and bring some of these open source tools to uh, some of the places, some of the communities I'm part of, but uh, yeah, I never really had the quite the uh, option. Oxwall is also written in PHP. Um, Jom Social is Joomla. It's written in PHP. But there's this one I'm trying to think of. Uh, and they're, they're rewriting it. Something red, because red is network. Hum hub. Diaspora, though, that's written in uh, uh, Ruby on Rails. Friendica, here it is. <laughs> They're rewriting this Friendica, but it's also being rewritten in PHP. Yeah, because I was looking at federated or decentralized social networks in particular. Yeah, PHP and MySQL, good stuff. Yeah, there's a bunch of um, instances running. But essentially, you know, it's a little bit, well, not as polished as some maybe more modern apps, but uh, it's under active development if you're interested in doing some that stuff. WordPress is still going strong, right? Yes. I've done, that's actually how I kind of cut my teeth on web development, more or less, was first with Joomla and then with WordPress. And then after a couple years, I got an internship in California uh, where we were, we were doing a rewrite, we were porting, we, we were, yeah, porting, I guess is the right word, moving f uh, we, uh, their, this nonprofit website from ASP.NET to Drupal. <laughs> and luckily I didn't have to do anything with ASP.NET or anything, and at that point I wasn't even really comfortable coding. I had kind of read a little bit on Python and Ruby on Rails. But yeah, WordPress is still going strong. One, my main sort of like concern with WordPress is once you get out of what you can do with WordPress core, you get into the plugin and theme ecosystem. And that is a mess. It's just highly commercialized. Everything has a pro version. All the support channels are in various forums or things. And then you get advertisements in your WordPress admin. Uh, it's just a... It's just a <laughs> So frustrating. As soon as you install WordPress, you're pretty much going to turn to a plugin for something, a calendar or whatever it is going to be. And Drupal, on the other hand, doesn't have, suffer from that. Um, the Drupal module ecosystem is pretty cohesive. There's integration. Um, there's standardized security policies and practices. Um, this Drupal 8 process, though, was a little bit painful getting over that hump, kind of like a Python 2 to 3 type thing. Now we're at Drupal 9, though, so I think they're pretty much moving on. But if I go, sorry, I'm scrolling really fast, but uh, where's the uh, modules? Build, probably. Download and extend modules. Modules and themes. Um, Yeah, you just have like, if you've done Python development, like say you've worked with um, Pandas or something like that, you know, you just have like projects that build on one another and they sort of augment and uh, they standardize APIs across projects. Um, you know, it's like harmony, harmonious, <laughs> harmony. And um, the WordPress, Plugin ecosystem feels like a lot of, I don't know if Discord is the right word, but it's just everything doing its own thing, not vibing with one another. And then um, Drupal is a lot more integrated, but still like any th place, uh, well, this is not a exa good example. It's There's still um, issues with viability, whether or not the plugins are maintained and whatnot. You know, like today I'm in Django here, I'm having to 
uh, remove um, a deprecated, so to speak, a, a package that hasn't been updated for Python 3, Django 3, that is. I think that's never going to go away. So yeah, you just kind of, kind of, I don't know, there's no, what I'm getting at, but uh, keep it simple and build on stuff that's been around for a while, that's going to stay around for a while. And don't be afraid of boring technology, right? That's my philosophy. Sort of get involved if you can. What? Uh, so what are you working on? Do you have any, um, let's see. Do you have any ideas brewing that you'd like to contribute to? Uh, any open source projects or anything that you'd like to kind of scratch an itch that you think would be beneficial for other people to use or your family or friends? I think we should be able to get rid of that error now. So if we run manage pi, we can create a super user. And I deleted my SQLite file. So it's just going to ask me a couple details. Hopefully it'll ask me an email. Ooh. Right, I need to migrate, then create a super user. So it's going to create an initial, well, it already did. This SQLite database just popped back up there. And this is going to apply a bunch of migrations from all the Wagtail stuff. And I should probably think about doing this Wagtail 2.8 upgrade, um, but maybe not in the same pull request. Just get too many moving parts and things will break a lot easier that way. Just making personal project ecom site with React and Django backend and Django restaurant. Oh, have you heard of Sailor? S A I L O R. Maybe it's S A E L E L O R. Mm. Yeah, Sailor Sailor storefront. This is probably what you're trying to build, <laughs> to be honest. No, it's from Magento. Switching from Magento. No, nope, sorry. Wait a minute. This is built with Django. Let me just go to the source. Yeah, Django 3, in fact. That's already built for you. This would allow you to just get on with um, putting up the site, and it would be a really great way if you want to ease into it and maybe make a small contribution to an existing open source project that has really good momentum. I highly advise this. I know there's a lot of great things you can learn from, from doing your project, so I don't mean to dissuade you uh, from doing a ground-up thing, but... Um, just like we turn to Django because it's got batteries included and it's mature, if you kind of when you get involved with an existing project, it's got trade-offs. You'll have the steeper learning curve of an existing framework and how things work in that paradigm, but you'll also have just like something that's useful right away, and maybe you'll find a shortcoming or a bug, and you can just make a small improvement of that thing and ease your way into it. I don't know, so definitely. Certainly choose your own adventure. But yeah, you can see it's got a pretty good, it's got some interesting gaps in some of these contributors, but uh, I wonder why that happens for several of them. Yeah, cool, look, yeah, definitely it's, see some GraphQL, which is another thing I haven't gotten around to um, working with in the Meteor Dev, development group actually created uh, I think it's one of the most popular GraphQL um, I don't know if framework would be the right word Apollo they created this Apollo thing you probably have heard of it if you so that's basically what happened is Meteor probably couldn't find its niche couldn't find a business model and the company pivoted and GraphQL became the hot thing on the market, and so now they, they wrote, I think, one of the, 
know if it's de facto, but uh, it's like one of the better <laughs> GraphQL implementations. Okay, and you're using Next.js. That's the React um, server rendering framework, isn't it? Next.js. By Zy yeah, React framework. Okay, cool. You know, maybe this is going to be something that's uh, going to get closer to Django and functionality. But I just don't like that. Very cool. And I wonder what kind of uh, frameworky things Next comes with. So it's got pages and stuff and routes. So it's got a router built in. But no authentication. So then you have to start assembling your own framework, which is so many new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you there. Focusing is hard to do. But I think, honestly, just check out this sailor. I think, actually, it's going to jumpstart you. That's what my intuition says. Because it's already, like, on the same path. You're, like, already in the, resonating at these frequencies. It's just at a different octave, maybe, or something like that. You know what I'm saying? You guys are you're playing the same chord, you're playing the same, same mode, scale, thing. With your um, e-commerce site, do you sort of have ambition to start an online shop, or are you just kind of uh, interested in the premise and building an e-commerce? Um, project. So I think we can do without managers. I've got my migrations in place. Let's just run this create super user. And we're just going to do um, start tech email. Okay, here we go. All right, we're getting closer. I just need to take a quick break and debug this error. I, th I figured there would be some kind of tracebacks going on. This is not going to be super seamless, uh, but fortunately this project is in the beta phase now, so we can kind of thrash around and break stuff uh, without having to worry about, you know, migrating a production website or anything like that. This is the time to do the, the user accounts. So I will be right back. All right, cool. So yeah, Tatsuo says, just the premise of doing e-commerce after that, wanted to build a real estate type site. That sounds cool. So you're kind of getting a uh, feel for how to, you know, scaffold and build uh, useful websites. What are some of the patterns that you'll follow in doing things with Django? I certainly am still doing that myself. In this project, um, we have a little bit of an e-commerce uh, component, a couple of those I should mention. We have payment processing, shipping calculations, uh, subscription management, which uh, has online payments, and we're going to work on recurring 
subscriptions. Uh, order management invoicing is on the roadmap. We're going to be looking at PDF invoices as soon as I can get this um, project running again with the user model. I can give you a tour of the back end, but since I'm swapping out the user model, I can't really <laughs> do anything until I get this working. But uh, let me show you this book. I'm not a salesman. I'm not affiliated with Pact. But I'm I actually recommend this book. It's all the code is open source. It's MIT licensed. Um, PAC, Pact Publishing have, um, in my opinion, sort of a mixed quality level. I think they went through like this period of like five or so years where the qualities went. You know, they weren't even doing really. Um, they weren't catching you know grammatical things, and uh, there was a lot of errata. The code samples, you know would have missing stuff. I actually reviewed a book for Pact. It was kind of fun, though. <laughs> it was a little bit more stressful than I thought it would be. But um, that's what I think. Recently, the quality's getting a little bit better. This book, Django 2 by example, I bought, and I found a couple bits of errata. Not a lot of grammatical stuff to be annoy annoyed with, but uh, the parts that were broken, they have worked in the source code, so... Uh, if the book was, for some reason, I couldn't get the code from the book to work, I would just kind of copy and paste from this. And I literally um, used, I think, two or three chapters of this book to build the e-commerce, like, at least inform the, the way I did the e-commerce stuff. It's not one for one. And I also give attribution to it. And, uh, yeah, the book is, like, probably 30 or 40 euros or bucks. The reason I'm recommending it, it's relatively recent. All the examples are going to still give you the frame of work, framework of knowledge, the schema, schema, schemata, uh, to use to develop websites with you know modern Django conventions. There's a few things you'll adapt it. It's written for Django 2, which is still relevant even though Django 3 is out. For this 40 bucks, though, you can get like a, it's like four months of subscription to the packed unlimited thing. So, and a lot of times Pact will give these deals where everything's like $5 on the whole site. So you might even just wait for one of those. I don't know. And I think that's part of the way their quality suffered was that they were just like selling things rock bottom. In any case, this is a good book, and the reason I'm recommending it is if you look at the table of contents, you end up building, I think like five or six, you build a blog, a social website um, with user interactions and subscriptions and stuff, uh, online e-commerce with payments, e-learning platform, um, and you learn some, you know, how to build an API and how to optimize your site and how to do deployment. So it's actually going to give you each chapter, is it's like, or a couple of chapters is like a standalone project. You'll build these things, kind of like the path you're taking. Yeah, so it's worth the money. Uh, like I say, f for ten dollars, you actually get quite a lot of um, a lot of books and stuff of varying degrees of quality. Books and videos, though, their whole library. Uh, anyway, the Pact's not my favorite publisher. Manning is, but I don't know if Manning has got any Django books. they do. And, oh, and there's this uh, recommender systems, practical recommender systems. Which if you're going down the path of like doing these um, e-commerce real estate types things, you'll be looking at recommender systems pretty quick. Some kind of machine learning at least. Yeah, sorry if I'm overwhelming you a bit here, but just got to share this stuff because it's really, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Now this book I have a copy of. This book actually uses Django to build a movie recommender site. All the source code for this book is this the, yeah, January 2019 is pretty much brand new, right? Sort of. Hmm. There it is. All the source code here. 
was on GitHub, Movie Geek. Now they say it's a MEEP, which means Manning Early Access Program, that you can read the book while it's being written. You know, this code is up to date. The requirements text is using Django 2. Django 2 is okay, not a big deal. And basically it's going to give you some patterns to follow if you've got like a catalog of items, either real estate options or e-commerce things, and you've got a, a group of users who've interacted with those items on some level or expressed interest. I think they have in the e-commerce one you'll have people who've made purchases or for the book, uh, movie recommendations, people who have uh, said that they've watched this or that movie. And uh, then you can whoops, make meaningful recommendations. And I'll just say that Manning, I think, have the highest quality of uh, any technical publisher from my perspective. They do really good, uh, high editorial quality, high um, code example quality. They keep the books up to date. They fix the errata months or sometimes years after publication. Um, they don't play around with the prices though. The, well, I take that back. This book is actually on offer right now for half off. So I was going to say that I rarely ever see um, any discounts on Manning books. I wonder why. I guess maybe they're doing something for COVID-19 or something like that. Interesting. Yeah, but a lot of good stuff there. Manning.com. I have it. Oh, an upcoming Django book. Ah, no, no, no. Dang. <laughs> Bummer, dude. Movie Geek. And then my friend, I'll give a shout out to my friend Marcus Shepke or Shepard. I hope I'm spelling his name right. Yeah, I did. Uh, no, Shepke, I spelled it right. He's a mathematician. He he works. We work together on doing this. Uh, um, some machine learning related stuff. Let me just get this. I'm sorry, I'm going a way, wayward route here, but I just need to get his profile, and then click to the profile, and then board game recommender. Here's the same thing. Also written um, in Python with. I think he's just using. Flask or something, I don't know what the web framework is. But he's got this deployed, it's open source. And if you're interested in board games, which Marcus is a big board game fan, uh, it'll take information from Board Game Geek and match you with board games that it thinks you would like based on your interests. And it's live here at Recommended Games. <laughs> yeah, so there's some great stuff. If, and that's my recommendation is like getting involved, checking out these other projects that exist and kind of just dovetail on their um, inertia, their maturity, so to speak, the community, rather than kind of going it alone. You'll you'll get you know far going it alone and you'll learn good stuff, but uh, yeah, surround yourself with creative people, right, and work on these projects that are bigger than your ambitions could uh, probably grow to. And yeah, that's <laughs> my philosophy, I guess. I don't know how much I follow suit. I'm building this little, well, this is a project for a nonprofit organization, and it's a bespoke website, so all these um, features are informed by the needs of the uh, organization. Okay, but now we got something, no such column accounts, username. So let me make sure I've got my, because we don't have a username. Field, right? We have a email field. This might be why they define the model manager. Let's see if I can get something on Stack Overflow. I 
it might be I just need to specifically follow this tutorial to find a username as none. That's strange, though. So they're doing it to remove it. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I need to. You know, I didn't do is make a, this migration. Oh shoot. Yeah, that's what I, I forgot to do. This might be okay as it is. Let me delete this database. I'm basically, I'm changing the database structure. So I need to migrate my changes in. Make migrations and migrate. Just need to set it as none. It's kind of a kludgy thing, but okay, I'll go with it. I'm still going to try this without the custom user manager. I don't want too much code to manage. Oh, shoot. I meant to use abstract base user. Because I don't want the first name or last name fields. This is really something I should talk with the website editor about. What fields we want on the registration form. Let me just redo this. from abstract base user, then we should be good to go. Ah, I need to hear from abstract base user. In which case, I might not need this required fields. Yeah, it is bare bones. Hmm. Interesting. All right, cool, Tatsuo. Thanks for stopping in. Yeah, hopefully see you around. Good luck on your learning journey. Let me know. Keep me up to date if you uh, have any open source projects or whatever. I'll gladly do pair, uh, programming or code re view if you've got a pull request or any ideas you need help with. So maybe this permission is mixing this. Well, I'll stick close to the guide. These are coming from the same So I might as well do that. So let me just see what this permissions mixing is. I hope I don't have to redo this. So that's there. I was getting here. No unknown fields. Oops. Okay. So this is interesting. It's going to give us the super user groups and user permissions and some methods. Why are they overriding it here? Um, to put a, is staff and is active. That's those are different. Hmm. Can 
Actually, there's a mix in for those as well, but okay. And they're gonna be active by default. to go. Migrate those in. All of the things, I think I reset the database so it's going to run all of our migrations. For Wagtail, and then hopefully this will this work with the Wagtail registration form. Things line up and I'll have to revisit the authentication flow. Right now we have a simple authentication um, or registration flow where you just sign up and you're you have an active account. But we might want to add an uh, email verification stuff or something. All right, now I can create a super user hopefully. Ah, so you do need a manager. Yeah, it's just this, um, I guess the, both of these custom user, abstract base user and abstract uh, user don't provide a manager. This is strange. So when I'm trying to run this create super user, it just doesn't know. doesn't know what to do. This is why it's nice to use that auth tools package because it handled all this for me. Give credit to this. This is another problem. It's it's not like explicitly open source, so even though it's a tutorial. I think 
this. Uh, maybe it would just be easier if I did this. Use the abstract user. They're still using the manager though. Careful with copy and paste code. <clears throat> I don't think that'll require a migration. Let's see. Because it's not changing the database sort of field definition. Throw away password. straightforward but then again we had several digressions and things like that so maybe it's not too bad and there's this nice tutorial tutorial so welcome to our new web channel sorry okay so wagtail that looks pretty crazy why is that so big This is just the new design. I'll try to do this 2.8 upgrade if things work out. Yeah, I think this is the new Wagtail admin UI or a magnified like crazy. Yeah, this looks normal now. All right, so what we need to do, and this site has been under development for over a year, so there's a lot of features, and um, now we're really going to be able to go through all the features in this live coding series, but if you do want to check out the code, you can go to this, uh, where is that, GitHub, Western Friend, slash WF dash website. All the code is there, you can check it out. Uh, feel free to adapt it to your own needs. If you need, uh, if you have any questions, 
open an issue and I can respond there. But what we got to do is just quickly check out the registration flow from the front end as an anonymous user. So in order to do that, I just need to create a new page for our welcome page. I'll delete this default page. So now we have no content. From the root of the site, I'll add a child page. We've got all these content types. Home page is our sort of landing page for the front of the site. The first thing, the root level URL. I'll publish it. Notice that it's got a moderation workflow built in at the box like WordPress. Didn't have to do any of that coding. It's got multi-site baked in out of the box like WordPress. And since I deleted the default content, I just need to, it automatically deleted the default site that was, that came with Wagtail out of the box. So I just needed to recreate that. Now when we go to the root URL, we're served a welcome page that uses our, our site template. It has like login and log out buttons and things like that. So the first thing we'll do is just see if I can log back in. And again, we're just using email and password fields on all these forms. The wagtail stuff is automatically generated and it looked like it worked. Uh, let's now check the registration flow. Uh, this should be all right. For those, you have to have a little bit more strict password. And if I register, registration successful. I'm now logged in. No errors down here. Okay, so good to go. I'm gonna give a shout out to testdriven.io for this excellent tutorial. I will include um, attribution for this tutorial in our source code. I only wish they had like an MIT license or something on that. I'd feel a little bit better, but you know, if this is sort of factual knowledge, I'm only using a fragment of it. I think this is, qualifies as fair use. It's published for educational purposes to begin with. So I think you're supposed to be able to adapt educational materials um, to your own needs. It's pretty informative and it's a relatively recently published and they all even show us how to get forms created and register the custom user with the Django admin. Very useful mod, uh, very useful tutorial. Wagtail does a lot of that for us, so we only had to really touch the user model and manager, which is kind of nice. So, attribution. I think that's kind of fair enough. It's non-trivial stuff, so I'm glad to have a resource like that. Man, we'll just commit to all these with one commit message. Well, yeah. And I'll remove the auth tools package. I hope that won't break any other dependencies, but let's find out. One thing at a time. So we're running poetry. I think it's a Django auth tools, if I recall correctly. All right. Let's make sure <coughs> I'm not using that somewhere else. I'm Pretty much done with this, these few tabs. Run the server again. Ah, right. I'm importing it still somewhere.
Makes sense. Well, just here's the printing off. Could be a dependency that's importing it. Ah, I need to remove it here. And then hopefully we have this um, Django sort of um, authentication workflow package. I can't remember if that came from auth tools or what. Good. So yeah, I think I got a little bit more energy. I'm gonna merge this in. I'm the only developer, so I'm kind of like a little bit ad hoc with how I do these things. I try to keep them um, sort of organized, relating to a task and a pull request, focusing on one uh, change set, natural change set. Um, yeah. So we'll do this two eight upgrade. See if poetry discovers any other uh, dependency upgrades. And then I'll continue, I don't know if I'll be on the live stream tomorrow, but we're working on a data import. So that was actually the work I was doing beforehand. It's in another branch uh, where we're migrating the Drupal data into Wagtail and I need to write custom importer, um, they're called management scripts that let you define commands in like this manage pi, create super user type of stuff. And uh, I'm using those management commands to import CSVs of data that we've exported from Drupal. I don't see why I couldn't just stream that. It's pretty specific to <laughs> our project and data model and everything. Maybe it's generally useful or interesting to other people. And certainly we, it gives us a good opportunity to have other conversations and hang out in a pair programming style. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try to stream that tomorrow. I'm going to be working on it tomorrow uh, so I can demo it at our we have a meeting once a week on Wednesdays with Mary. Good, so let's commit these changes. What did we do here? We just cleaned up, removed auth tools. I'll just push this, open a pull request, merge the pull request, pull <laughs> to change down. This is gonna be silly, but anyway, sort of a standard flow. Remove auth tools, remove. Yep, let's just clean up that. And remove auth tools folders. Yes, everything's there. Good. All right, one second. Let me just push these up to GitHub. By the way, you may have noticed briefly, I've got a couple of remotes, and when you push um, on VS Code, it'll ask you which remote you want to push to. We've got a remote setup for this tool called Docku. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but uh, it's basically like Heroku, but it's open source, platform as a service. And you can kind of host it in a you know, $5 a month DigitalOcean container. Depends on, you know, you might need to spend a little bit more if you've got a pretty busy website. But it, once you get it up and running, and DigitalOcean, for example, even has a one-click installer. There's probably other... Um, sort of VPS hosts that give you that. Um, but yeah, it's very nice uh, developer experience. You essentially just push your changes up from whatever branch and then Docker automatically will build and deploy the site for you just like Heroku would have otherwise done. But you just don't have to pay. Um, I don't like the pricing structure of Heroku, but I do like the developer experience. Cool. So we push that, let's open a pull request.
essentially this is going to close oops. This one. maybe we'll have some bugs fall out of it but from what I can tell I'm very cursory testing it things just worked and now we're using um, get text so we have some localizations When I link it up here, you should see GitHub links the issue together, and then when I rebase and merge this, I don't know, are you a rebase or a merge commit or a squash and merge? Let me know your, your preferences in the chat. I don't have a strong preference, but we've had a humorous debate at work on the data team. Um, and I guess our conclusion is just pick one, make sure everybody's using it consistently and don't use both. You don't use merge commits and rebase, just pick one and uh, make sure everybody's cross-trained. <clears throat> merge commits a little easier and more sort of natural, uh, intuitive maybe for new developers, uh, but I think rebase has some um, benefits and I've sort of inherited the habit I don't have a strong preference. Cool. Now we've got that um, code merged into master. Let's go ahead and pull down our changes. I should do that while this server's not running, but there we go. Let's just try this upgrade dependencies and see how much snag, how many snags I hit here. It should be, well, I'm not going to knock wood. So poetry can do that for us. Let's create a branch. make sure we're pulling from the same uh, head uh, commit that we have on GitHub. And I think it's just poetry up, update. So I should say update, up, update, upgrade. Similarly with Ubuntu, it's like first you update your repositories, then you upgrade your packages. Okay, we've got several new dependencies. Ah, there we go. There's a Django 3 upgrade because now uh, Wagtail 2.8 and above supports Django 3. So I wonder why we were getting those some of the Python 2 deprecation errors there. <laughs> I guess upgrading dependencies is not so super exciting. I just lost all the viewers on Twitch almost. <laughs> I will work on making this stream a little bit more interactive, having the chat up here on the, um, a little bit like above the uh, video, for example. I'd just go work out that bug with OBS, my OBS upgrade, and got rid of the browser plugin. I think I'll just switch to the Snap installer. Maybe that'll work a little bit better than the Ubuntu. OBS packaging. I'm not sure why that. <laughs> I upgraded OBS to 25 so that I could use this browser plugin that you can put HTML elements in, uh, in the stream, which is really cool. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do at that point. But then I got a patch upgrade just today that somehow it's not included in the build. So, and I just need to figure out the layout. If anyone's got suggestions for how to lay out a um, a live stream with community features. I'm, I'm welcome. I'm open to your suggestions. I'm welcoming them. Okay, let's run the server see if we get any major errors. expected this three upgrade it's a major version upgrade so we have some kind of growing pains here a 
wonder if I need them even. What are they? Mm. So static is when you have links in your templates that are linking to like images or some other kind of th thing that's not coming out of the database. And uh, Django will automatically generate URLs based on your static files configuration. And that's exactly the error I'm getting. From Wagtail autocomplete. Oh no, yet another dependency. Let's double check this one. We need this autocomplete tag. Dang. Wait a minute, let me just slow down here for a second. If I grok the whole thing, I don't know if it's the with the autocomplete or just I need to change a lot of code but uh, certainly this wagtail hook is coming out of my site packages this is not code I'm managing let me double check where we're using wagtail autocomplete and see if anyone else has reported this error it's kind of surprising though if not Okay, so close. February 12th, but that's come and gone. It's merged. Did it get released? I mean, yeah, this is an official Wagtail package, I think. I'm just a little bit confused by the Wagtail master. I guess that's just the name of the branch. February 21st, Django 3 support, 0505 version 05. All right, let's, let's check our package. 
maybe it just didn't get worked a lot of complete dependency upgraded. Actually, I just want to look at the poetry lock. Or there could be a top level dependency. This is just means greater than. Hmm, maybe it hasn't been published. We're using this, so I. Kinda gotta keep it around. I did, but okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. I don't know enough about poetry, apparently. So if I edit, I have to manually change those. Huh? That's supposed to do the whole thing, so. I'm not sure what happened the first run. Let's read this now. Those are the ones I manually changed. I don't want to drag these along. Maybe I just updated poetry a well. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, let's see. right there, but let me just, 1.05, no, that's close enough, this must be, a, oh, it's an alpha release, I 
didn't check what version I was running before. Poetry update. No different. Okay, things are working now, though. This is a warning, and it's relating to the again that Wagtail autocomplete, which is an official Wag officially maintained Wagtail package. I hope they will. I'm sure they will resolve that. It's a warning of an upcoming deprecation. I can ignore that, but. So a little bit of maintenance <laughs> work today, a couple hours of maintenance work on this uh, sort of beta project. We're hoping to deploy it, so pretty soon we're in the content migration stages. What we want to do is get some basic um, content in it and uh, kick the tires a little bit, find um, rough edges, improve those. Um, it's hard to estimate exactly when this project will be deployed, but probably within the next couple of months we should be. Close. It's hard to tell. So we'll just do one more pull request. In any case, yeah, you can find us on uh, GitHub, Western Fran, WF website. If you want to kick the tires on a wagtail um, Django project, if you are interested in contributing, I could help. Uh, get uh, help you get started setting up a development environment. Hey, what's up, Max? How are you doing? Welcome to chat. That's about it. Just rebase and merge this one. I'm doing pretty good. Just hanging out, doing some coding. Not sure if there's another task I could work on. It's just at the top of two hours. <laughs> now that you're in here, I don't want to just run off all of a sudden. What kind of projects are you working on, Max? Or what are you interested in learning about? I, get, I got a little bit more tea left. I could hang out for a little bit. Oops, sorry about that. I do need to eat dinner and do a couple things to wind down. It's 8 o'clock here, almost. Are you doing any Python or web development? No, I guess what I can do is I can <laughs> switch over. I was getting those errors I mentioned earlier in this other branch I'm working on. So uh, I need to actually rebase. And this is going to be an example of how, I, how you can shoot yourself in the foot with rebase. Are you ready for this? This is fun. So I'll close the server. I need to now, um, basically what's happened now is the master branch has changes. This might not be an issue, but uh, since I forked off of the master branch earlier, and now some changes have been merged into the railroad lines has, has been merged. And now I need to take my branch that's still like in limbo. It's not quite, uh, <laughs> sorry, ready yet. I need to just, lift up all those commits and move it to the tip. That's what Rebase is doing, from my understanding. 
Max says they're working on an Amazon Alexa chatbot and have it actively change the website. Really cool. What are you going to update on your website? What's the name of that? There's another one you might be interested in. Um, Have you checked out Mycroft by chance? This guy, I actually worked at this uh, roundabout small world connection with the one of the co-founders of this project in Lawrence, Kansas. Well, actually, where Django was born, in fact. Uh, I was working at this uh, internet service provider called Lawrence Freenet. And uh, uh, the, f like the guy, the founder of Lawrence Freenet, also, kind of co-founded this project. I don't know how actively they're involved anymore with it. It's basically just an open source Alexa where you build your own um, actions or whatever they're called. Skills. And you can buy the physical devices or you can just install it on like a Raspberry Pi. So Max is building a message bot with Alexa. The bot can change anything from the home page to creating a whole new page. Hey, that's pretty handy. <laughs> Man, maybe you could tie that into this, like a Wagtail CMS thing. That would be pretty crazy. Like, because Wagtail has actually a built-in API. Dude, yeah, Max, if you could contribute in to Wagtail, that would be nuts. I bet people would really appreciate that. Uh, if we look at the Wagtail features, well, right here on the front page it says headless, uh, meaning it has, gives you a API by default. I think it speaks GraphQL and REST. And yeah, you just post some JSON to it. You can create new pages and all that good stuff. Max says the, uh, the Alexa coding is, is really hard mostly. Why? What's... Uh, what are you finding most challenging? Like uh, the semantics of it, uh, the documentation parts, the, are you feeling a lack of maybe support, ecosystem support? Oh, and you have to work with Lambda. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, it makes sense it's an Amazon thing, isn't it? So they're gonna for they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna what's the word there wrangle you into their whole yeah all right serverless lambda sh <laughs> shenanigans I'm at a loss for words check out Minecraft though you don't have to maybe worry about that yeah there's AWS is just a freaking there's no such thing as uh, user experience on AWS is what our AWS ops engineer uh, told me firsthand. He's a, an expert. Uh, AWS, he does all of our AWS stuff. And we are, we are <laughs> all in on AWS. We are deep in it. Yeah, cool beans. Uh, this might be a little easier, especially if you can just get it up on a, you know, well, Linux or Raspberry Pi and then Write some commands. Forget about all the cloud stuff. You just make an API call right to it. Let's double check the docs, though. Uh, yeah, so it's got some parsers. This is not telling me much about the hardware. Written in Python. It's a good sign. And then you train it with skills. And those skills are apparently. Let's just see one of the skills. Here's one if you're going to look at the dictionary. Python. 100% oh, Python. Can't beat that. How does it work? Well, it's not. these aren't all Python, but yeah, I guess GitHub's ignoring them. So it's got some tests. Yeah, some JSON there. How does it work? 
Mm, here we are. This looks a lot, <laughs> probably more user friendly than what you're looking at with AWS Lambda and all that. Uh, I mean, just they're freaking, you go into AWS console, it's just a nightmare. Okay, yeah, that's good. That way you'll get an easy win and then maybe come back to Alexa, you know, uh, sure that there's some benefit to that as well. But then, then with this, you won't have AW, uh, Amazon kind of listening into your, your home. There's a ton of these. You could probably just pick one of these up. I bet there's one that's already been shared that's very similar to what you're trying to do. It's like posting to a WordPress website or something. Are you using a content management website? Uh, or is, is your website going to be like a static HTML or markdown blog or what, what kind of thing? says they're working on a custom Google skill not using WordPress it's static okay that's let's see then there's like a you know like something that'll save to a markdown file probably would be what you're after and uh, sorry is this static HTML or are you doing like a markdown static page generator Saw something that would be useful with me. Static HTML. Okay. Hmm. Mostly. I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect Jason would be easier for you to work with in general than like XML parsing and that kind of thing. But I don't know. And if like uh, you'd use a WordPress or like a Wagtail and get that API for free and just make, it's just a post request to an API endpoint with some JSON, it'll create the new page there or a put to update an existing page. Okay, you're like three, four, something you started two weeks ago. Yeah. Hmm. It seems like I'm just trying to think of what I would phrase this as my crawl. Multiple API calls and Mycroft skill support. Web, uh, web click inbound. Firebase. I don't know what Ross is, but this might have a little example. So they're using requests. They're going to interact with whatever Rasa is. is like an assistant for your assistant. What is Rasa? What is Rasa? Build a minimum viable assistant. Improve it by talking to it. You might like this also. I don't know, since you're on that. Yeah, if you want to chat with it and stuff, this Rasa sounds like it would be a good one too. And the main thing is that you run, you see you have a server running Django or whatever. 
and you just post to it or put or patch. This is just standard Python stuff, you know, the request library with some JSON. I think that's going to be pretty simple, relatively speaking, probably not two weeks of work. In particular, you can get started with Wagtail in two minutes. Just humor me on this, but uh, a few lines of code to run a Wagtail server, and right off the bat, you'll be able to create pages programmatically via HTTP calls. And you'll have an, an user interface. It's it's a content management framework, so it's really powerful. It's what I'm using for this project. Or do a WordPress or something like that, but I wouldn't fiddle with maybe static HTML and margins. Just seems like I don't know. Doesn't I don't know, it's intuitive. To, uh, oh, I have uh, oh Mac. I'm sorry. Streamlabs bad bot has deleted all of Max's content. This is the second time this has happened. It's very strict. And I don't know how to configure it. Let me just disable it. It's supposed to help me with some moderation things to prevent spam, but I configured it to purge the messages, thinking that it would just purge the one message that was problematic. But it purges everything. Instead of just the one. So I'm just going to have to It would be it makes sense, but not every message that the person has sent. Okay. I might not be using Streamlabs much longer. I'm gonna. I'm also looking into some integrations to make this um, the stream a little bit more interactive and friendly, and not like clobbering people's uh, messages. But in any case, sorry about that. Uh, okay, you, it's disabled now. You can go ahead and post. I think you're probably posting some code, and I just didn't include. Oh, okay. So right now I have a. Say, Alexa, open Max's skill and change your website manager. H1 tag, it's all good. So that, that's parts working. Okay, sounds good. Oh, yeah, here's the Minecraft skill, basically. You just follow these kind of standardized. You have an initializer function where you do your work there and a method to make the call to the API and post that JSON. And you use this decorator to register it as an handler so that uh, some knowledge required but basically you define your custom function and hopefully you have a couple of layers of abstraction so you're not doing everything in one massive function and you register those intent handlers with Mycroft
Seems like it would be nice if Mycroft has an official uh, listing of intents. Or whatever they would be, skills or intents. So you're allowing other uh, some maxes. I'm gonna add some other things to check to make sure you're only editing your website and other people's. So some backend stuff. That I think would be another place where Wagtail would be useful because Wagtail has built-in multi-site and authentication and everything for you out of the box. You don't even have to think about it. You just start using it. Hmm. You have to verify. So that's the authorization. Authentication and authorization. Uh, Wagtail. Uh, mm. .io. I'll just show you here actually on our local site. But essentially, uh, built in authentication, authorization, and then multi site users and groups. You can have groups of people assigned to a site. You can have, though I'm not running the server, the, they can manage the content, uh, it has a moderation queue. I think this is a, might be something useful. Yeah, definitely. I'm just, I uh, really like Ad Wagtail. I've had such a great uh, experience with it. The core developers are very welcoming, very helpful, uh, gentle when I, for example, seek uh, technical support in the GitHub issues. They say, well, I'll try Stack Overflow. But also they uh, acknowledge sometimes that it's a feature request and have even implemented like small features I requested. Pretty cool, really great project. Cool beans. So yeah, I guess I'll just really quick switch to this other branch and see if that, uh, the watch the rebase foot gun in action. Uh, initial date to import. Right, I pulled. Because I have to rebase this now. Let me double check. So let me go back to master and just pull the latest changes there. One moment. So I forgot to pull. Let's then check out initial data imports. successfully rebased because I don't think I had any conflicts or anything and then now my local git branch is out of sync with my remote branch and this is the foot gun this thing this bit me for like years couple of years at least almost um, and other developers where we'd be like trying to merge something that we'd rebase locally and then when we try to merge it on github it's like merging in commits that had been rebased in there and it was like a mess and the deal was you have to force push now and this is my colleague Marcus doesn't like it, rebase for this fact that he says you're rewriting history I sort of agree but you know, it's just trade-offs so I have to now get push force with lease that's the key you're gonna force push it so it's saying whatever is hap whatever the state is locally this is what I want to be on github at the end of the day and you're doing it with a lease so if like something happens It'll roll back. It's uh, my friend Tony, ex colleague, taught me this. Because, ah, one moment. Oftentimes you'll work on a project with a lot of contributors and everyone's in their own branches, and you basically just need to rebase every morning before you start work. And uh, that master branch is changing all the time. So, yeah, you just get this in your like muscle memory. It's just pull the master, you know, check out master, pull it, check out your local branch, rebase master into your local branch, and then push your local branch up to GitHub with force push. Um, that way you're good to go. You can honor the team's commitment to rebasing 
and uh, not wonder why your pull request now has you know 400 commits from other branches that have been merged into master since you forked. All right, cool beans. I think that's it. I'm just gonna run it actually. I wrote a little tutorial on that on um, dev.2, but that's basically what I just said. All right, still that warning, unapplied migration, because I'm in a branch. because I've got migrations I've written in this branch. Uh, that's the problem. Basically, I've had to make a couple changes to the model to handle um, our data import, some fields that got omitted, and I'll have to make a couple more changes to the model as well um, when I come back to this tomorrow. But right now we're at two and a half hours. Yeah, thanks, Max. And uh, yeah, I hope that rebase doesn't uh, come back to bite you, but... I guess the idea, the reason why, you know, so if, if you're good with um, merge commits, just no shame in the game. Um, I think why people like rebase is because your your little commit history, your commit graph, and in fact, VS Code has a new way of visualizing this. I could try it. Uh, it just stays straight. You're you're just always putting your latest commits on the end of the line. And with merge commits, somehow when you branch out and you do a merge commit, uh, that commit will have two parents. So it'll have the previous master branch and then yours that came in there. And um, it becomes, I don't know if it's cyclical, but if there's uh, cycles in the graph or what. But for some reason, that's not desirable. So rebase keeps everything nice and straight. You know, I've never had to do anything fancy like going back and reverting history or pulling cherry picking or get bisecting or anything like that. That are some of the claimed benefits of rebase. I've never experienced those personally. Not to say other people haven't. Let me just try this real quick. So there's a new feature in VS Code. If I click a file, maybe, or I click view. If I right click a file, you can say open timeline. Ooh, nice. Oh, here it is down here. How do you make it bigger? Come on. Well, it's all linear. Plus, I didn't change that file. And it doesn't update when you change files into. <laughs> Editor, that's strange. So maybe it's half-baked feature. In any case. All right, Max, thanks for hanging out. Hope to see you around the stream again. Hey, thanks for the follow. I just noticed that. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to make a couple of improvements in the stream tomorrow if I can get that new, uh, get my OBS fixed to show the HTML uh, stream elements. I might switch away from this literally using the stream elements. Uh, stream labs thing. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% committed to any of those, of course. But if you got any suggestions, do you do any streaming, Max? I can check out your uh, user. I don't have uh, a bot set up right now to respond to that command, but I do have the repo link in the video, github.com slash westernfriend, or if you just want to link in the chat, here you go. Sorry, uh, user t which user I will uh, try to get my bot <laughs> configured as you might have seen earlier uh, it deleted all of Max's uh, messages because I had it configured to be too strict wait a minute what the heck how did I get in that circle I already merged that 
good to go. I am building a website for a nonprofit organization called Western Friend. It's a bespoke website for an online magazine that has some community uh, focused features as well as an online publication dating back to 1926. All of the versions of the magazine and print publication from 1929 are available free to read online and they're hosted by the Internet Archive. It's pretty crazy uh, how awesome the Internet Archive is. They've scanned them all, digitized them, run optical character recognition so you can read it in your browser and have it read aloud to you. Uh, this is all just done by the, West, uh, the Internet Archive in general. I just want to give them a shout out. This website for Western Friend also has um, an online bookstore, a multimedia library, it's just got some e-commerce type things, uh, contact form. You know, it's uh, basically they're trying to sustain this organization through outreach and fundraising via the website and other means. And we're porting it over from Drupal to Wagtail Django. The tech stack, other than Django and Python, well, that's pretty much as much as I've um, been focusing on for the last year. To do a Django site, you don't really have to think much deeper than that. Uh, I will be, but I will give some mentions since you asked. I'll be using the Postgres database. And for deployment, I'm going to be using, and already am using, Docu. It's kind of like a Heroku, but you host your own. It's got some really quick ways to get these Docker images set up and interconnected. Um, you can spin up a, basically you just commit to your, your repo and you push to the Docker remote and it rebuilds the site once you've got everything set up. In LinkedIn, it's got um, ready-made add-ons for Postgres and a bunch of other things. Uh, let's see how you... And it, it's using this build pack standard, which Heroku invented and now is becoming kind of a... Um, hey, thanks, Max, for stopping by. It's good chatting with you. Have a great day. Um, I think Cloud Native Computing Foundation is now... Packs IO, it's becoming like a standard <laughs> through some, yeah, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Yeah, so that's the deployment layer. And for example, there's some Django Docker tutorials. If you use DigitalOcean, you, you can deploy Docker on that. But other than that, it's like one command is really straightforward. Um, you know, if we just look real quick. It's a few commands, so you wget to install it and sudo bash because you trust things from the internet. Uh, then you trust some uh, public keys. But the trustworthy here, you've got a basically a Django project already set up probably, and you're working with git, so you're just adding a new remote so you, you can push your changes there. Um, once you push to master, it's good to go. I thought this would give an example of how to integrate Postgres. It's also just one command. Anyway, great question, user Witcher. Here we are. User T Witcher. So there's all sorts of little options here, of course. Um, Redis. Let's Encrypt it. Also really handy. Nginx. Ah, uh, yeah. So we'll be using, uh, I think, Nginx somewhere in the mix. I've got stuff like RethinkDB, RabbitMQ, MySQL if you're into it, Mongo, MariaDB, Graphi, Elasticsearch, CouchDB. So yeah, it'll basically just give you a little graph of, of um, nodes, wire them up for you and make it really easy to deploy just for right from your command line, just like Heroku, but without the strange pricing structure. And you just get these commands, you can do database dumps, importing, check your logs, start and stop the services. It's really cool. I like it. So that's what we're doing. Wagtail, CMS, Django, and Python underneath. Postgres for the persistence layer and Docker for deployment. I think that's all, all we're having to think about, really. And we did do some searching for the um, VPS provider, and I think we just kind of decided that at the end of the day, DigitalOcean is the best value and uh, really simple and familiar for 
from our organization's perspective. Can you use cookie cutter of Django for Docker scripts? Can you use cookie cutter of Django for Docker scripts? Ah, yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, in fact, um, Wagtail, let me just show you my proc file. So Wagtail also sets you up with a Docker file out of the box, just like cookie cutter Django does. You know, you're running G Unicorn. Unicorn, G Unicorn, I guess it is, isn't it? Uh, and then in your proc file, you just what did I have to do special? I think it detects that it's a Docker file. Let me just think for a second. I haven't touched this in a while. Could be this uh, runtime.txt. No. Set up a CFG. No, no, no. Might be that in this case I'm not actually using the Docker Docker file, but I know that Docker gives you the option of using either a proc file, which is the simple standard way to do it with um, like Heroku. But let me just double check this for you. Docker file. There should be some docs on this. Docker file deployment. Yeah, if you want to have that option. You just set it in the config. I'll, I'll send you the docs here. Do you have an idea about using multiple DBs with Django and Postgres? Um, like, uh, are you talking like horizontal scaling, like redundancies, or are you talking about storing subsets of data in different databases? I've seen some stuff on both of those. Uh, in the case of the latter, for example, I've seen a tutorial where you could use Django for your uh, Postgres for your main relational data, and then um, Neo4j, for example, for your sort of graph-oriented stuff, and you could stitch them together. Uh, the Django ORM can be configured for multiple databases. I've not personally done it. Let me double check this. Yeah, because your Django settings pi can have multiple. database entries there. And <laughs> but you're getting into some heavy heavy stuff, I don't know. But yeah, so you can just have a couple databases. Here's a SQL, MySQL and a PostgreSQL looking side by side in harmony. Um, then you want to migrate your databases separately. How do you specify you can specify DB for read, for write, and you can probably, hmm. on a model level, specify that it should go in one database or the other. This is one thing, just the Django docs are awesome. <laughs> But this is like kind of for replication, so that would be the first case. Yeah, you, maybe if you. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really tricky one. The setup and everything is working great, but they're very slow. Oh, okay. Ah, well, that might not be a Django problem. What? So that's a big... That begs a lot of questions. What's slow about it, though? Let's start there. Where are you noticing the slowness? Are you using, by the way... Um, I think it's Django DevTools. What is it? Django. Django Tools? Can you go debug toolbar? Because this will get you some tools to profile your views and things, and including the um, ORM layer, so what's going on in your queries. You need to get some insight, basically. you got to find out what's the slow, what's the bottleneck, the slowness there. Um, it could be anything down to your, um, your VM or VPS could just have too little resources for it. 
compute, I don't really know, but uh, your queries can be really inefficient. Django might be writing inefficient SQL. Uh, I don't know how this would play with uh, multiple databases, but. Uh, Just take a look. You know, something like this, the waterfall fall of your um, view requests uh, cycle and the come on, how do I make this bigger? Template profiler. Well, that's not quite what I was thinking of, but yeah, you get your SQL performance here. Yeah, excellent. This, uh, I thought Cookie Cutter uh, Django comes with this out of the box. Make sure debug is true in your settings pie or your, that you're running uh, Cookie Cutter Django has a strange, uh, in my opinion, uh, way of structuring things, but they have like the s reasons for things, firstly, though. But uh, they have like a dev settings and a prod settings. Make sure you're running your dev settings or debug is true in whatever settings it's choosing. You're using REST framework. So yeah, you wouldn't have any template slowdown, but you need to be able to audit. You can you can use REST framework and still use Django debug toolbar. All you need is a view to interact with the database. Otherwise, let me think. Hmm. Just need a profiler is what we're after here. You can try this. Um, explain. This will give you a low-level way of getting. Are you using Postgres, for example? Here's something we use at work sometimes. Um, what is it? This one. I have a lot of tabs open. I just. Some of these. Not that one. This is the one we like. You'll need two things from it. Um, get the output. Ah, dang. See, we just use this directly. Well, heck. We use this directly from our Postgres um, clients like dBeaver. But you don't have the sort of speak to I don't know the luxury. But uh, if you're doing this through the Django Orm, um, what you could do is use the Django Orm to generate the Postgres, like the query code, and then run it through Explain by you pasting this line into your dbver and then the query. And uh, sorry. So yeah, it would be like in your query. So yeah, sorry if I'm st stuttering a bit here, but um, you know your your database tool has like a SQL editor in there. I don't know if you can see this if it's big enough. So anyway, you post your query in there and you run it, but you run it with this line in, on the top of it. And that's going to give you some JSON output that explains the costs incurred through that query. You'll paste that JSON here and your query here with or I think without the explain. You're going to get a really cool visualization of the um, explanation of the query. In other words, the where your most time is spent, where your most memory is spent. All right, cool beans. Uh, and here, sample plans. Let's double 
let's look at a couple of these and if I submit that and run it you can see it, it's going to give you like a tree and it's going to show you the highlighted areas where there's a lot of slowness you can pan around it see where you're spending your time 9% of the time 20 milliseconds here this is it this is the name of game is just profiling, getting some insight into what's going on underneath the hood. So you'll need to do two things there. Either use query set explain, and that might even have the method to, to JSON. Yes. Uh, the problem here, so you'll need the format JSON here. And that'll give you the thing. And then. We all want to. That might be a sufficient. That might be enough because uh, if you look here, we're not actually. This is optional to paste the query perfect. Just paste the execution plan here. Cool beans. Sorry for <laughs> it was a little disorienting there for a second, but that's what you should do. And I'll send you. I already sent you this link for the uh, Postgres Visual Explainer. Explain Visualizer, which is open source on GitHub, TypeScript, and Vue.js. Hey, cool. And the Django Orm docs, telling you to profile first and use this query set explain. You're into some advanced territory. Good luck. <laughs> I hope you are able to optimize it. I'd be curious to see what the bottleneck is. I've never done what you're doing anyway, so with multiple databases and things. Pretty cool. Are you working on a, an open source project? By chance, or are you, uh, there's a secret sauce that you can't share? Yeah, this is actually good. It's a private project. Yeah, no worries, just curious. And check your indexes. That's uh, this really the Django docs are awesome. Just really read this. But um, that's what's going to be my next recommendation is just make sure if you got if you're doing aggregate functions or something like that, you've got those columns um, indexed. That's going to speed it up a lot. What else have we encountered? Uh, you hopefully aren't hitting this, but if you're working with JSON data, JSON B data, hopefully it would be JSON B at least. Um, there can be some pain in that and deeply nested JSON B. I'm not sure how well the Django Orm is uh, ready to handle that. Um, check your joins. How many? I mean, those are indexed, but uh, you know how many joins you're doing, how big the query is, what kind of data it's pulling it, uh, pulling together. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, I understand. You can't explain. No worries there at all. But uh, yeah, I'd be curious. So. Uh, I gotta kind of call it good for tonight. We're almost at three hours. I I don't I like to do streaming for too long. I get kind of fatigued. Uh, it's hard to concentrate and be productive. But I uh, I will come back refreshed tomorrow. Probably around five o'clock Eastern Europe time. So we'll be doing just some um, data ETL type things, transforming. So essentially we're migrating data from um, Drupal into Wagtail. And I already have some uh, migration functions here that we've been writing as management functions. So we'll learn more about that. If you've already gone down that path, I would appreciate any uh, feedback or wisdom that you have to offer as well. And I'll try to have a little bit more interactivity on the uh, stream, at least showing the chat. I'll start there, and I'll dis disable the bot so it doesn't ban, doesn't delete everybody's text. Just learning, learning as I go. Cool. All right. Okay, so the indexes are good. The query is big. Lots of joins on multiple tables. Ah, yeah, I think we're getting to it. This is actually where you might start getting into NoSQL territory. Uh, data localization, data locality, I guess is the thing. 
you can pre-cache your views. Materialized views are really handy for this type of stuff, actually. We do this all the time, in fact, uh, where we get these big analytic queries. We're going to join stuff on multiple tables, going back, you know, sometimes years of data aggregating at different levels. Um, but we don't need to do it at query time. We really are running those types of queries once a day, once an hour, once a week, once a month. So you can you can get into Postgres territory where you materialize those or cache those. Um, you create a view or materialize view, and you ca so it caches the result of the query. Django also has hooks, a hook pattern allowing you to store your data in a normalized form, but uh, either in the transaction or after the transaction, you can then uh, I guess it would be denormalizing it into uh, more like a JSON. B column that has the data pre-joined, so then you just query this big array of JSONB. There's some optimization techniques that you could probably get into. I've never done those with Django, but um, I'm sure people have done this. <laughs> There's that Django 2 by example. It's apparently got some advice on this Django 3 by example. What? <gasps> oh, yes. When is this? This came out? Nice. Yeah, so just you're know, using these like signals. And when a signal is received, like a database insert or something update, it'll store it in the normalized columns and then denormalize it into your sort of optimized, you know, query optimized columns. And you can still do this right in Postgres. You don't have to do any uh, MongoDB or anything like that. Postgres is very versatile. I'm going to send you this link to this book, Django 2 by example, just because it's really been helpful on my uh, learning journey. I'm not affiliated or I'm not making any commission or anything, and I'm sorry for that. It's a really long link. There's no affiliate stuff in there. It's just from my Google search. Let's see if I can get uh, simple signal to denormalize vote counts. And there's a Django snippets one. This might be a good one. Just to give you some practical uh, you know, examples. So yeah, you send an instance, then you grab the data out of the table. Uh, so this look like it's running a little bit of an aggregate here. Yeah, it's going to recalculate it in a hook. And yeah, you're basically doing this much more advanced version of this essentially, where you're instead of calculating a you know like uh, running a reducer on a, a set of votes, you're probably aggregating data at a, you know doing the join and then storing that into Well, I don't know. I don't know about your challenge, but yeah, something like that. There's a package for it. This is a really good question. Thanks for bringing that one up. Django Denormalize allows you to convert a tree of Django ORM objects into one data document. With a data document, we mean a structure of dictionaries, lists, or other primitive types that can be serialized into JSON or a Python pickle. What? This is exactly what you're after. <laughs> this is it. Let's see. No release history. Nah, that's iffy. Bucket to yeah, I couldn't recommend this with with good um, hmm. Dang, 
That was, <laughs> I thought that was a good find. It was really close. <laughs> this might be kind of cool. Django Con 2018. Normalize it until it hurts. Denormalize until it works. <laughs> there might be some good uh, information there. I've got to post all these uh, links in the, the YouTube video. There's a ton of links in the chat. Oh, man. All right, then. All right. Two hours, 52 minutes. I want to call it good. I'm getting kind of tired. User T, which user are you still in the chat? Thanks for bringing up the question about... Uh, Database optimization, that's quite interesting. I wish you luck on that endeavor. Got to go, great. Yep, all right, so you must be uh, east of me then, huh? Where, what's your time zone, by the way? I'm in uh, Eastern European time. Anyway, I hope to see you around. I'll, I'll be broadcasting a little bit earlier tomorrow, so you don't have to, if you can stop in, you don't have to be up too late for that one. IST. Okay, very cool. All right, well, it's nice to meet you and hope to see you around some more. Once again, this has been a live code hangout for CodeBuddies.org. We made some good progress on updating our dependencies and we'll hopefully be in a better place tomorrow to continue working on the um, transformation code for our data migration. Thanks for everyone who has participated in the chat. It's really great to have people hanging out. Hope to see you around. Uh, more on Twitch or CodeBuddies.org. Have a great day.